Hello, y'all. It's your boy Chris, and I'm back again. I want you to run outside and just yell in the general direction of all your friends. So sorry that I've been away for such a long while. I appreciate it if you like, share, and subscribe if you was digging my style. For all the shares and great comments, I'd really like to thank you. And I'm about to bring you the most descriptive video you'll find on Norm Bega. First, I would like to share with you, probably the only sponsor you'll see on Deciphering the Devil's Details, is Lemon Tartan. This is the company that my wife and I own. It was her company from way back in the day, so don't get it twisted. We ain't jumping on the Tartarian bandwagon. She named it this a long time ago before we even knew about all that stuff. We make some, some aprons, some hats that are parent and child matching hats. Completely unique, completely handmade. Uh, the wife macrames some beautiful tops. I tie-dye some t-shirts there. If you're down, it's Lemon Tartan on Instagram. You send us a message. We, you find something you like, we'll ship it out to you. And so, of course, this is, this is my Instagram that I got here. You guys are more than welcome to follow me. Send me direct messages if you want me to check some things out. I got some pictures. I must admit, I don't get to this as much as I should. But I check it all the time. So, I just need to get my act together and start posting stuff more onto this. Yeah, there's my tie-dye onesies. And there's all the hats that we make parent and child had some some pretty funky ones if you guys want to go and check out all the pictures we're going to be posting more real soon that leaves me into this i got to give some shout outs to john levy he mentioned my mentioned one of my videos in one of his videos and yeah ever since then it's been crazy like if you really look this was the day before there was actually the screenshot of his video i have 625 subscribers and literally like two days later i got 2000 i think i'm close to almost 4,000 now it's it's crazy the guy guy just goes around bigging up everybody on on the internet it's awesome <laughs> keep it up brother keep it up right just like that guy says right there thank you so much let's get into the video so john levi made a video months and months ago in the summer probably about norm Bega. he wondered what it was what's going on come some of the stories sound pretty crazy and fabulous and stuff right you know it tripped me out that this is right basically around where i live I see this and I'm, that's the river that I'm on almost. Yeah, so it got me, it got me pretty crazy that there's this crazy old castle in this river just north of Virginia. So I had to go and do my research into it and I'm going to bring you all the research that I've basically done about it. We'll start off with Wikipedia because that's where everybody gets their shit from. So we just, we'll start off with their shit first, right? Norumbega is a legendary settlement in northeast North America, which appeared on many early maps from the 1500s until the American colonization. The houses were said to have pillars of gold, and the inhabitants carried quartz of pearls on their head. All right, so we'll see how accurate that is, but we'll, we'll, go, we'll get into it. The first person that they come up on here is this Jean Alphonse. He's this guy here, and he's a Portuguese explorer. So he came through here and he discovered the mouth of a great river. To be honest with you, that's basically all I could find about what this guy said. Everywhere I look, it's, it's just really hard to find some of these, like the first descriptions of this place. I couldn't really get too much into this guy. If anybody else wants to, it's that door is open for you if you want to walk through it and dig it up. I had a really difficult time trying to find that information. He showed it lying south of Acadia and north of New England. The town of Bangor, Maine is basically where everybody thinks it is, and they called one of their municipal halls Norumbega Hall. All the rest of these people are from the 1800s, and these guys are trying to find it, but they're coming from it from so, like, you know, this is like 300 years after all the stories were told about this place, and all the legends were told of this place, right? So it's like, a lot happens in 300 years, especially with these moths running around just raping and pillaging everything that in sight. We'll get into, we'll get a little bit into uh, this guy's story too about it, because I have a theory about that. So the word Norumbega was originally spelt Orenbega in Giovanni da Verrazzanzo's 1529 map of America. The word is believed to derive from one of the Algonquin languages spoken in New England. It may mean a quiet place between the rapids or a quiet stretch of water. 
So I got a little interesting little theory of my own about where this Norumbega place is. And that's going to be the very last thing. I'm going to give you their malarkey of history. And then I'm going to break down Cypher and the Devil detail styles. And I'm going to give you my theory at the very end, all right? Let's find some of these people. So they really don't tell you anything about David Ingram. David Ingram was one of the first people to meet any of the actual indigenous people. And as far as you can really tell... He's the only person to really see Norumbega and give his description of it, right? Him and two other guys, some Spanish boat, marooned him somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico. And he basically hoofed it from Florida to Nova Scotia, 1569, right? That's a pretty crazy little walk. They even had their own little map of their little journey that they did up to the spot that they went to. And they always tell you that this guy went all the way to Cape Breton, but we're going to show you some stuff about that too. So basically he says that he's seen El elephants and a couple other interesting things that they basically go ahead labeled it as fiction and they said it couldn't be possibly true you kind of have to learn a little bit more about this guy to figure out exactly what's going on with him right and this this old map that he has that they somehow they along through here we'll try and map out the journey a little bit but i'm so i'm going to try not to make this video too long i'm going to try and give you the coles notes of everything so for the life of me when i was i worked so hard on trying to find all the information i could that I was going out of my mind trying to find this David Ingram guy's, his book, like his actual report that he did, that he gave about exactly what happened here. And it is so hard to find, but I found this website and I'll link it in the description. I'm just going to jump down here for a minute. This is the only spot that I could find. And it says this section quote below is the, the best surviving version of Ingram's account. Okay, so apparently he gave three different versions of his account. This one is that we got the privilege to read. Basically, all the rest are buried in somebody's vault or the Vatican or wherever you want to say wherever they are. But basically, this one little copy, and it's not even the full book. It's like just a little snippet out of the book. It was even published 300 years after was this book we're getting. The book is like a third person account. The guy who wrote the book is asking David Ingram questions and he's answering the questions and that's how the thing's written. It's not written like this was our journey from here to here to here to here to here to there. The guy's just asking questions. What are the people like? What is this? What is that? Well, how are the rivers? How are this? How is that? And if the book's written like that, you don't really know if he's talking about down closer to Florida or, you know, New England, Virginia area, if he's actually talking about Norumbega, if he's talking about anywhere else, right? From from the, anywhere else, Nova Scotia, like it just kind of varies from where they are. And none of the, the names of any of his places that he says are there. So let's get into his account, I guess, right? So this book was published in the 1800s, but you can tell that the actual writing is in 1500 times because it's like really hard to read sometimes. Some of the S's look like F, some of the words half spelt. I'm going to try and do my best to read it to you, and I'm just going to kind of go through some key things that I think he he says about his encounters here. All right, so there's a advertisement or something here that we'll just start with this part over here. So basically, it just introduces him. Uh, it's four years after all this of the sundry things which he, with others, did see in traveling the land of the most northerly part of the Bay of Mexico, where he, with many others, were set on shore by Mr. Hawkins through a great part of America until he came within 50 leagues or thereabouts of Cape Breton. So he didn't quite get to Cape Breton, but he got pretty close, right? Yeah, so as you can tell, it's not like the easiest thing to read, right? You kind of have to retrain your mind on some of the things like this word is persons. <laughs> so basically the Cole's notes of it all is that uh, in 1568, him and two of his boys basically were shipwrecked six leagues to the west of the river. River Camin or Rio Dominez, which standeth about 140 leagues west and by north from the Cape of Lorda. They traveled towards Cape Breton about 11 months in whole. It took them 11 months to do it. So apparently there was a guy in like 2003, he retraced their steps and he did it in nine months. So it can be done. Maybe they chilled out a little bit more.
more than he did and not just kind of hoofed it but it's apparently it's it's doable to walk that distance in 11 months so in which time as the said ingram thinketh he traveled about land 2,000 miles at least and never continued in any one place for about three or four days saving only at the city of balma where he stayeth six or seven days i don't know where balma is but maybe we can find out right there are in those parts saith he very many kings apparently the when he uses kings like this it means kingdoms not just like a king it means like the whole kingdom as a group they're just chiefs they weren't kings here the kings commonly within 200 or 120 miles one from another who are in continual wars together so the first king that they came before dwelt in the country called Gizika, who caused them to strip naked and wandering greatly at the whiteness of their skins let them depart without further harm <laughs> But yeah, you gotta think that these three English coming up from Mexico or Florida gotta have the funniest farmer's tan. And their bodies are probably so white, right? Obviously, these guys weren't white. They were dark-skinned, like everybody here. I'm gonna have to get more into that on another video. The kings in those countries are clothed with painted and colored garments thereby you may know them and they wear great precious stones which commonly are rubies six inches long and two inches broad they are balling out with rubies like huge right like when they do mean to speaketh with any person publicly they are always carried by men in a sumptuous chair of silver or crystal garnished about with sundry sorts of precious stones like that is pretty freaking balling that's in Gizika, wherever you can find Gizika. All the people generally do wear menelons or bracelets as big as a man's finger upon each of their arms, the like on the small of each of their legs, whereof commonly one is gold and two silver, right? So they're rocking some sweet bracelets, man. And many of the women also do wear great plates of gold, covering their bodies in manner of a prayer of grits and, and many bracelets and chains of great pearls. They're just balling out. They got pearls, they got silver and gold bracelets, they got, you know, these plates of plates of gold apparently on, on their wearing on their chest and stuff. So let's hear a little bit more about them, right? The people commonly are of good favor stature and shape of body of growth about five feet high somewhat thick with their faces and skin of color like an olive and towards the north somewhat tawny but some of them are painted with reverse colors they are very swift of foot the hair of the head is shave shaven in sundry places and the rest of their heads is traced it's really interesting that they're all of complexion or tawny right so we're talking about so by nowadays standards it's uh orange an orange brown or yellowish brown color so if we jump into the etymology dictionary it's uh, a tanned color late 14th century uh, from anglo-french so it's basically light-skinned people using it to talk about dark-skinned people when they use this from or likely the brownish yellow or tanned leather right from old french tanné dark brown tan they're telling you it's, they're just supposed to be fairly brown people like i'll say like a mulatto their trumpets that's right they got trumpets here they do make of elephant's teeth they have a kind of drum which they make of beast skin they have trumpets and drums so they're not so non-sophisticated when they came here eh? they, they had instruments their weapons are darts headed with iron the heads are 
two fingers broad and one finger long, which are fastened with within a socket. Pretty good stuff they got going on here, right? They have short broad swords of black iron of the length of a yard or very near an L bearing edges thicker than the backs of our knives somewhat like the foils in our fence skulls they got basically got black iron swords that's not it the normal iron that you'd commonly find back in the day here's the first mention of norumbega the cannibals do mostly inhabit between norumbeg and Berniash. they have teeth like dogs teeth and thereby you may know them all right that's that's right they have teeth like dogs so I believe Baranash is like Newfoundland or it's PEI, like I think it's that area, but I'm not 100% certain. I'm going to have to look that up. A lot of these places you can't find. It's just, you're just basically guessing that we're at, right? So it says here that they use the palm trees. So I'm assuming that's more in the south, maybe down near Florida, I guess, that they use palm trees during war times to make a drink to, to remedy against poison arrows. So that's, you know, that's pretty cool. They use that their buildings are weak and small force are made of round like dove houses and they dwell together in towns and villages and some of them have banquet houses and in the top of them made like the louver of an hall builded with pillars of massive silver and crust frame square where of many of them are as big as a boy's leg of 16 years of age and some less so i'm assuming that's like diameter of it is like a boy's leg long i guess but what i'm getting into is that there's great pillars in these great halls so there's some buildings aren't weak in small force they're actually great halls that they would congregate in and have great banquets and have all the you know people around would come and party out in these great halls that had louvers on them which is like it says here there's a one beside that louver it's a lantern so they got lights on top shining out so are they possibly using atmospheric power to light up these lanterns is it just fire maybe they had some kind of antiquitech on these great halls which we're finding all over this great continent okay so for some reason they call david ingram the guy being interviewed x i don't know ex with a t i don't know exactly what what that is a short form for but that's how they refer to him so it says this x did also see diverse towns and villages as gunda a town of slight show in length so there's a town gunda ochala which is you know possibly could be ochalaga there's ochala a great town a mile long balma a rich city a mile and a half in length bega a country and town of that name three quarters of a mile long there are good store of ox hides Sagnanath, a town almost a mile in length Barinianath, a city a mile and a quarter in length also there is a river and town of that name but less than first about mentioned so i don't know if that's gunda if it's less than that let's drop down here a little more so gunda a small town and river both of that name and this is the most northerly part that this x was at they have in every house scoops buckets and diverse other vessels of massive silver with, with they do throw out water and dust and otherwise do employ them to their necessary uses 
in their houses. So they bought it with all the silver that they're just using it for whatever that they needed. They got so much of it that they can just, you know, they can just use it for whatever they need it for. Like, I'll make a silver bucket to throw my water out. I'll make a silver dustpan. And all which this ex did see commonly and usual in some of those countries, especially where he found the great pearls. There are also great rivers at the heads where of this ex and his companions did find sundry pieces of gold, some as big as a man's fist, the earth being washed away with the water. So there's just gold aplenty here, right? Big gold nuggets just washing up in rivers, in the heads of rivers here. And in other places, they did see great rocks of crystal, which grew at the heads of great and many rivers being at quantity sufficient to load ships. So they're saying that you can come on over here, just load up your ships full of all this gold, take it on out of here, and do whatever you want with it. And where did all these, where did all these crystals go? Where did all this stuff go? How come there's not more here? They came here and got it all. Just like how there's no golden, <laughs> no giant silver pillars here. It says, also they passed over many great rivers in those countries, in canoes and boats. Some four, some six, some eight, some ten miles over, where of one was so large that they could scarce cross it. The same in 24 hours. Also he saith that in the same countries the people have instruments of music made of a piece of cane almost a foot long being open at both ends which sitting down they smit upon their thighs and one of their hands making a pleasant kind of sound and they do use other kind of instruments like the tabar covered with a white skin somewhat like parchment this x can't very describe every gesture dancing and song after long travel the foresaid David Ingram with his two companion Brown and Twide came to the head of a river called secret blanked out which is 60 leagues west of Cape Breton where they understood by the people of that country of the arrival of a Christian whereupon they made their repair to the seaside and they found a French captain named Monsieur Champagne I don't know who this guy is in 1569 Samuel de Champlain is like two years old or something like that. So when this is all going down, he's not around, but there's a Monsieur Ch Champagne going around doing a bunch of stuff in the early 1500s. It was, I'm thinking this is, this is the St. John River. They blanked out the name. It wasn't, when obviously they wouldn't have called it the St. John River, but uh, the St. John River is about 69 leagues west and it's like the only big river that far east so there's nothing really closer to it in that 60 league area so he's probably estimating you know the landmass might be a little bit bigger whatever they're different i'm thinking that it's the st john river they were picked up on but uh we'll see about that and just to make things interesting, this Monsieur Champagne, he's the captain of a ship called the Gargarian. Pretty interesting, right? Pretty close to Tartarian. Like I said before, I'm not necessarily on the Tartarian trip, but there is some interesting little things that come up, and there's some other things that will come up. The rest of this document kind of comes really militant-like and how they can make slaves and how they're... It talks about how they are ready to embrace the Expian faith. Christian or Catholicism, one of the two, and it's it's a bunch of BS. It's basically where they, they force their religion upon them so that they can just basically enslave the ones that don't want their religion. Isn't that your great religion that you love so much? The one that basically came here and raped and pillaged everything from all the indigenous people here? But I digress, some people would say. Oh. Yeah, and so basically that's all really says of about Norm Bega in particular. I'm going to link this thing. You, you can read it if you want. I'm going to get into the next guy that's talking about Norm Bega. If you look at here at Wikipedia,
Lady. The next guy I'm going to talk about is this Giovanni Verrazzanzo, because he seems to be like the next guy that would know the most about it. All right, yet again. So this is another document that I spent a whole crap load of time hunting down and trying to find. This, this is going to be in the link below. So yeah, we'll just get right on into it. We'll try and find what we can find about uh, him talking about his Norumbega. But apparently he went on this huge voyage and this guy discovered a whole crap load of stuff. And uh, I'm going to get more into it when on, in another video. It doesn't really seem to be too much about Norumbega or anything like that. It just kind of sounds like he just went up the coast and seen all these rivers. And I don't know. They just that by this one document that we have from him, it doesn't really say much about Norumbega. But I'll leave this linked up. And if you go over and you find something else and share about it, there you go. You're more than welcome. All right, now we're over here. I'm about to read the book with the longest title ever. America being the latest, most accurate description of the new world. And you can read all the rest of that. Long ass title, man. Read a little bit about Norum Bagel. I must preface this, this is written in, I believe, the 1800s, so it's 300 years after the last people were talking about it, so a lot of shit can go on at that time, and a lot of things get stolen and taken away, and pirates and privateers, and, you know, people just coming over here and doing some messed up shit, because they can. Lying between Nova Scotia, northward, and New England, southward, is so utterly untaken notice by many as a distinct province that it might seem to be swallowed up and lost in the two countries between which it lies or at least to be thought of a part of Virginia or New England for Virginia largely taken is said to contain New England Novum Belgium and Virginia especially so called and that so much rather because the Bessabies, not sure who that is, but the Bessabies, accounted by Sansund Aberville, an ancient people of New England, are written to have lived near the river Peniscob. Okay, so this is the first spot where we hear them actually putting a modern name onto Norumbeg, which is reckoned to be the same with Pentamgovit, or as some will have it, Norumbegwa, from which or from a certain great city of that name, the country for fancy sake must need to be denominated but since most commonly we find it named and treated of a part, it will not be improper to follow that method, carrying the boundaries of New England no farther northward than the river Quinnebequi, or Sagadahawk, and so determine the main part of the country to that space between the aforesaid river and Penamegovet. I'm probably going to say that differently every single time I say it. Excepting a small southerly portion upon the banks of the river Shoviket, so that it appears chiefly situated under the 43rd degree of northern latitude. As for the towns or cities of the province, there is a very uncertain account to be given. For as much as the pretended great city Norumbegwa, from whence the province should take its appellation, is not a acknowledged by any of the most authentic modern writer, nor in any late voyage or discovery of any mention made either of that or any other considerable town or city. Dr. Halen supporteth it to be no other than Agancia. Okay, so now we got Agancia. All right, so we're going to look into that place a little later. A poor little village that seems composed of a company of huts or sheaves covered with skins of beasts or, or the bark of trees. But the most favorable conjecture is that it might happily be the ruins of an ancient town. Like I said, this is in, I believe, the 1800s. If they left it 200 years before that, it 
could look like ancient ruins, I should say, which the natives called Arambak, probably deserted it long before the arrival of Europeans in those parts. However, it is so not very probable that the name of the country should be derived from this city. If ever there were any such or from the river, which appears to have been termed Norumbegwa on purpose to make way for this derivation. Whereas Pantagrove is the ancient appellation that properly belongs to it, nor hath, nor hath any modern one been applied to it but that of Rio Grande by Bruno in the in his comment upon Philip Averius upon what ground is hard to tell since it is observed by Halen and others to be neither large nor otherwise much to be commanded being navigable not above the 20 or 30 miles in respect of its many great characteristics and many great guitar tracks and falls of water and inconvenience with which many other rivers of America are many are projected or, and rendered impassable. This goes in to talk a little bit about the, the hills or the, the islands that are in front of the place. The aforementioned Bruno, though he names as belonging to Norumbega, there uh, these several places, uh, Porto del Ruggio, Porto del Rio, Paradiso, Floria, and Angolima from some obscure French testimony without particularizing any author, yet he afterwards confessed that the names given by the French and those applied by the Spaniards are so various and disagreeing and breed such a confusion that no charts or descriptions had concluded upon either. So it's like they don't know where it is. As for those who will have Norumbeg derived from Norwegia in respect to the colony brought thither from Norway, if the etymology not but a little too much forced, the invention may pass well enough till a better be found out. So basically, the Norumbega title didn't come from Norway. If you research Giovanni del Verrazzo, you will find that he went around and named a whole bunch of stuff after some guy, Norman. So he named like uh, a bunch of places in France, like Normandy. He named a bunch of places named Normanville. It's like a whole bunch of little communities in France. Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised if he threw the name on some Norwegian people or like Norse people if maybe he just kind of threw his name on those people or something and but I believe that he just kind of threw his norum on the front of this thing basically the rest of it's just talking about the soils and the temperature and how they're, they're really good and some hills are crabby mountainous and the woods really good tons of nuts the plains are peaceful and all that yeah so that's basically his account or sorry, that's a basically that. He basically says that it's it's one hundred percent definitely its own region and that there's they're basically hinting around that other names for it. They give us the river Penobscot, we get Agencia and Arambak. So out of those three, if you type in Agencia, there's Agencia in Hancock, Maine, which is right near the Penobscot River, right at the mouth of it. But there's not really much else you really hear about it, but you hear about the Abenaki or the people that lived here came even before for the Algonquin people. So here's this website, the basically the Marine Museums of uh, Penobscot. Um, this is their, what they think is happening. So here, so Geo 
Giovanni de Verrazzo looks for the northern passage and he comes here, right? And then David Ingram comes here and he walks from Florida and he's picked up in New Brunswick. That's where I believe he's picked up at the St. John River where a French vessel picked him up. Ingram told the fabulous city of, story of the city of gold. So this is where it all started from right from here, that spot there. And then it just keeps going on and on and then they, they, they look for it and they hunt for it and nobody can find it. So let's, so you'll find out that, so if you go to this site here and it tells you basically a little bit about the Penobscot River and they say that one of the alternative names is Agencia and there's Norumbaga. Basically, everybody says it's this one, Arambek. They have Arambek. If we're going to take their word for it, we're going to jump on to here. We're going to check out some of their spots. They say that it's in Bangor, right? So I was looking around in Bangor, right? So if we go drop down the satellite on that one. If you look at the map here, it looks like the town is on a great river. And it's on these ones always got a whole bunch of islands here. But that's because they want it to be the Penescob River, right? And Norumbaga is always sitting at the juncture of two rivers. Pretty much a lot of the time you'll see it's at a, the junction of two rivers. Or the river will go up and just turn to the left, right? Now if you look at... I got a bunch of spots going up at the Penobscot River. A pretty interesting bay here that's like the ones that they show on the, on the old maps with the two islands. And then the river kind of comes up. So we're going to first check out here is uh, Bangor. So we're going to zoom in on this thing. And look at this old block work you got going on here, right? Wow, right? Now we make everything like this. It's all concrete. So that old, old block right there, and then you got this old building with the block, the big windows. This all could be stuff from the people before us. Some old churches here. I was just going through their pictures. I don't know where a lot of these things are, right? Like, look at some of this. Look at some of these buildings set up here, right? Like those are a nice building. And you find spots like this that are look real mud flooded, right? Like that's a bowl level below the parking lot there, or what looks to be fairly big windows. So there's a couple spots there in this area that are mud floodish. Look at that, the steeple on that. Just look at the different levels and even the different brick. It's like up right up to here, it's a different color. Yeah, look at this, look at that craziness, eh? So who knows, maybe the ancient people here, maybe their lanterns are up in there. Yeah, Bangor's got some nice churches. And some pretty interesting old buildings. This is in Bangor. Look at that. This is Bangor as well. If you look at this building here, it's, you know, this hill goes all the way up to the top of the huge first level, right? And they have, they had to build this retaining wall around it, have an old, have an entrance here and everything. Wonder, uh, what the old pictures look of that one. Right? Pretty nice. The Bangor Public Library, you know, how long... He looks bad, boy. So if you go up a little further up the Penobscot River, you will find Old Town, which actually has like a, a native reserve, kind of wildlife reserve here. And you know that they always hide stuff on there, so you can't go digging. So then Old Town would be the next one that there's a split at. And so yeah, so they got some old buildings here too. But yeah, you can check that out. And they also have like crazy little thing here, like a biohazard sign out in the middle of nowhere and just random field. And you will note notice too that when you go to some of these spots, all these trees, like all these lines of trees, right? They're all planted like this. This isn't natural. The forest is just every which way. There's no lines in it. All these lines here 
are from reforestation. Maybe there was a great destruction here. They replanted, re-earthed everything over, replanted all these new trees. Everything here is new, and it's it's all over this place. So this would be Old Town now, with its old buildings. Got the old brick church with the old uh, st uh, stone block on the bottom. town public library right well, it doesn't look like much right let's take a plop down over this side look at that so there's your runway into the old library and then here's a whole other part that's <laughs> you know the hill the levels all out on it it's basically this <laughs> one of the same old buildings that you would find anywhere. Old Town also has this giant, giant building. Look at the size of this, right? And you'll notice that there's more levels down below this parking lot here. She's a mud flutter. But yeah, look at the size of this building. Imagine all the bricks that went into that, eh? I'm going to show you this one last thing before we leave. But they're doing construction here, and sometimes Google is just awesome, and it just gives you that little glimpse of the real past. Well, what's going on down there, right? Are they cinder blocking up the old tunnel that's literally like 8 inches? It's 10 inches? Foot, maybe? Below? sidewalk here this is crazy man look at that just under this building it's probably got a tu giant tunnel that's just running down the street right so we're just going to continue to follow the river up here how land see more more forestation or deforestation or reforestation right so how would it be the next junction yeah so there's just like just strange goings ons here with the the river we're looking for a great split there's like next one would be midland and there's all these mountain ranges a lot of the pictures of it they have the mountain ranges behind it right the top of it right where the water splits you have to think there's all these there's just all these kind of mountains along here that would be their theories on how everything goes down there is Gencia down here at the front part there's also this one here, Fort Knox on the Penobscot. They did all the work here on the, the there and all that. All right, here's the Wikipedia site on Fort Knox, Penobscot River. Fort Knox, now Fort Knox State Park or Fort Knox State Historic Site, is located on the western bank of the Penobscot River in the town of Bucksport, Maine, about five miles from the mouth of the river, built between 1844 and 1869. It was the first fort in Maine built entirely of granite. You know, previous forts were made out of wood, earth, and stone. So we're going to skim down here, a little bit of the history here. So local memory of humiliation of Maine at the hands of the British during American Revolution and again during the War of 1812 contributed to the subsequent anti-British feeling in eastern Maine. The Penobscot Expedition of 1779 aimed to force the British from Castine is just an area near that spot but if you look at it here castine is a town hamcock county in eastern maine served from 1670 to 1674 as the capital of acadia right so one might ha i might have to look in a little bit more into that place if it was uh the capital there for a bit but ended in debacle the americans lost 43 ships and suffered approximately 500 casualties in in the worst naval defeat for the united states prior to the japanese attack on pearl harbor 
In the autumn of 1814, during the War of 1812, British naval force and soldiers sailed up the Penobscot and defeated numerous American forces in the Battle of the Battle of Hampton. No name painting, I guess. Uh, how old do you think that painting is? Huh? Oh, look, it's pretty freaking pretty nice, though. All right, so we're back here on the Norumbega Wikipedia website. So we're going to scroll back down here because we're just going to check out this one last guy before we get into my theory on where I think this whole place is. It says here, in the late 19th century, Evan Norton Horsford linked the name and legend of Norumbega to supposed Norris settlement on the Charles River and built the Norumbega Tower at the confluence of the Stony Brook and the Charles in Weston, Massachusetts where he believed Fort Norumbega was located in honor of Horsford's generous donations to Wellesley College, a building named Norumbega Hall it was dedicated in 1886 and celebrated in a poem by John Greenleaf Whittier, Whittier? Well, however you want to pronounce it, that guy, linked it to a Norse settlement, right? Which we're going to find later isn't really proper, but we're going to roll with it. I think this guy's Norse settlement that he's talking about is Vinland. It's not Norumbega, but I believe he could have found a Norse settlement. It doesn't necessarily have to mean that he found Norumbega. <laughs> with that in mind, we're going to go. He built this Norumbega Tower, right? So we're going to jump over to see the tower. So here's the Norumbega Tower. The Norumbega Tower is a stone tower erected by Horsfield in 1889 to mark the supposed location of Fort Norumbega, a legendary Norse fort and city. It is located in Weston, Massachusetts, at the confluence of the Stony Creek. Yeah, I already just mentioned all this. The tower is approximately 38 feet 12 meters tall, composed of mortared field stones with a spiral stone staircase. That actually sounds kind of pretty cool. So he went and tried to link it to the Algonquin word. So there's a little bit more about here and all this stuff. And so here is the tower of a postcard from back in the day. It's just straight up, it's just a tower. <laughs> nothing really more, nothing really less. And they got this plaque here that says a bunch of stuff, but it's super hard to read. The Indi Indian utterance of Norumbega, the ancient form Bega. Whatever. 1889, this guy thinks that he found evidence of an old fort he called Norumbeg, which he linked to the Norse people, or he found evidence of the Norse people here in, in Weston, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. We're going to go and check out where that is. That's the Norumbega Tower right there. There's the Norumbeg Park, riding the coattails of this great story that nobody can prove kind of thing of where it's at. We have those two guys there, and this is the Charles River, comes down along here through Boston. So we have this old map, I'm gonna make an ass of myself, and I'm gonna assume that Horsford gentleman made this map here, where he found the city of Norumbega. He thinks that he found this big city right here, so he put a tower right where he thought it was. And if we jump back to it, that's the tower that he built, right? That's what they're telling us. So I'm assuming that that's the area that he built it in, right? So you'll notice that in this map here, Norumbega goes off and goes way up, right? So there's no telling really how high it goes up off of, off of this river here. But he found evidence down on the river. No telling how, how big it could be. If we jump back to here again, we're going to notice that if we come off of here, with a, we have what looks to be a lake or a big pond here. As we zoom in, this would could possibly be in the area that this guy's Norumbeg city comes right off of here. What is this lake? It is the Cambridge Reservoir. You know what reservoirs are. If you watch my video about Tower of Babel, I told you that they like to flood places of importance. It's really hard to do archaeological evidence underwater. We have now this big reservoir. So Stony Brook, Charles River, 
Weston, right? So the Stony Brook is a stream largely running through Weston, Massachusetts, then forming the Weston Waltham boundary and emptying into the Charles River across from the Waltham Newton boundary. It has two tributaries, Cherry Brook and Hobbs Brook. And its watershed includes about half of Lincoln and Weston, as well as parts of Lexington and Waltham. Since 1887, it has been the water supply for Cambridge. We're going to scroll down a little further here. They're going to tell you a little bit about this gentleman again here, telling you all about this thing right here. Right after they tell you uh, this whole story on this other website, not even about Norumbega, it's about the Stony Brook Creek. They're going to say, there are three large ponds, all artificial, in the Stony Brook watershed. The Cambridge Reservoir, this is the one that's that we're talking about right now, which was the Hops Pond. The Stony Brook Reservoir, which is Turtle Pond, and Flint Pond, also known as Sandy Pond. All these are artificial. This Cambridge Reservoir is artificial, and it's in the, or pretty close to this area, to where this guy thinks he found the city of Norumbega. So could they have sunk it? Could they have sunk this city under here? It looks like that guy's getting kind of flooded. <laughs> so it says here, right? In 1910, Hobbs Pond was dammed to become the Cambridge Reservoir. So this guy built this in 1889, this tower. 21 years later, they're sinking it. Could it be for a reason? So no one goes digging over there? Who knows? I think that this gentleman, this this guy here, I think he found Vinland. And he tried to attribute it to Norumbega. But they're not the same. Also... I think that there's good evidence that Vinland was also up up near the Miramichi. There's a lot of evidence about that. Maybe I'll get into that later, but it's not what this... I'm not doing a video on Vinland. I'm doing a video on Nor Norumbega, so we're just going to keep kicking it along. Did they just sink this guy's spot that he thought was Norumbega? Who knows, but it seems like they sink places that are of significance in the past. But I will like to tell you that this river, when you follow it, so when you follow this river and you go all the way up, so it's pretty big, you can go all the way up, but you can tell there's just rapids everywhere along this river. And now the whole thing about Norumbega is that it's the calm place between the rapids, right? But that would be like everywhere here. So you can pick your choice throughout this spot here where there's like just tons of rapids everywhere like, like especially the cities right there's more of the rapids going through it so you just come right along just keep going all the way along here and it's just rapids non-stop it's trying to kind of what i'm getting at it's not navigable right? and the whole thing is that this Norumbeg is supposed to be up a great river. The city that uh, David Ingram was talking about was on a great river. They called it Agencia, and I think that they are looking in the wrong place for Agencia. I think that Agencia is over on the St. John. You probably think, you know, Chris, you just think that everything's on the St. John River. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> but nevertheless, I think that there's some good stuff on here so let's go if we're looking into the agencia we get re led to the abenak and they're the people that were originally from here if you go to this one here where it says abenaki and their history it talks to you about how the penobscot is agencia and the word cannot be traced back to language except to the abenaki but it really comes back to this word here which really means our nephew agencia means our nephews agencia is like a latin term that's how we would say it nowadays it's not not an indigenous term the abenaki it would have meant our nephews from the word akun akun and this this leads us to the important historical discovery that the inhabitants of the penobscot river the etchemins were descendants of the abenaki the great and famous i don't know if that's a, a c or an o at the end so we'll say algeo family of family derives its name from the river Agencia. So there is no difficulty in explaining how the letter L is found in uh, the word Agio or Agiak and not in Agencia. The term, the root of the word Agencia is Akum with an aspiration between the first two letters Akum. 
K letters. A K. The aspiration by some tribes is sounded with a kind of crash in the throat. By others, it is sounded as R. By others, it is replaced with an L. We have innumerable examples of this rule in the Indian language. The change of the U to an A is grammatical. G and K become being converted letters. Akuntia makes a Aguncia, Aguncia, or Aguncia, from which the word Algonquin or Agio is derived. This explains why the whole Algonquin nation calls the natives of the Kanabec River Abnakis. That is our ancestors to the east. So these guys are to the east, right? So Aguncia is to the east of the Penobscot River. The Kanabec River, I guess. They say it's Penobscot, but I think it's more east. We, you guys can read it. It'll be in the links. So here's a little interesting little fact. They talk about a lot of different stuff here. We skipped a, a whole bunch, but basically say, this resolves several historical questions. It explains why the Penobscot Indians were called Tartines. Is that like, it's pretty close to Tartarian? Tartines? Tartarians? Tartarians? I don't know, you can kind of see similarity to it. It was because they lived on the Agencia River, which was called the Cradle of the Algonquins, who were called Ad Adirondack, Eaters of the Trees by the Iroquois to ridicule their unskillfulness in hunting. So these people were vegetarians, seems like, and... They got ridiculed by the other guys because they didn't hunt. Seems like pretty much all the vegetarians today. <laughs> the Indians in Acadia, the St. John River, and St. Croix, and Penescop. So they're going to explain to us a little bit about these guys. And there's this one. There's this picture here that if you scroll along, right, they're talking about its point. It's an Indian village. Sorry, I can't turn it sideways, but is that what you think of an Indian village looking like? The other settlement was on the St. John River, and so, and there they had several large villages. The Indians of this river are said to have been numerous and powerful. The river was called St. John by the French because they entered it on the day of the festival of this saint, but it was called Unogundi by its inhabitants, and Ulastak by the western Echemon and Abnaki. The, so the St. John River, right, is called Unogundi. And we're looking for, for a city called Aguncia. So would, would it not make sense that a place like Aguncia could have been on the Unogundi River? This river, the Unogundi River, this is the St. John River. So if you're just looking at an aerial view of, you know, there's the Penescob River, the one that they say that is the... This is the one that they say is the Norumbega and all the Gensia and all that stuff is. Or you have the St. John River, or Unogandi River, right here. Which one looks, you know, more distinct? I kind of like the look of this river. <laughs> Let's zoom in on here. So when I first saw the, on all these maps of Norumbega with where it's sitting right now, I, first thing I saw was Gemseg. It's kind of a river that keeps going off, but it's kind of a lake river, and it meets this spot here with this great big river heading off this way, and it's a huge river. That's where I thought it was. That's where I thought the river would just split off, like kind of how this picture is, where it kind of goes up and splits off. It doesn't have the islands here, but some of the, some of these old maps of Norumbega, they don't have those islands there. Some of them do maybe something that they're trying to lead you on with right this is uno gundy and we have the bay of fundy right is this really the bay of gundy originally so we're here on the Bay of Fundy Wikipedia site, and they are telling us that the Bay of Fundy got its name likely from the corruption of the French word fendu, meaning split. I don't know, man. I, I, I just don't buy it. It doesn't really sound like that. It sounds like Bay of Gundy, near Aguncia. If you look in here, so one of the things that they say about Norumbega is that it's called Oranbega. It's an Algonquin word. So maybe that's Aguncia. I don't know. Might be it. Who knows? Oranbega doesn't really sound like an Algonquin word, but whichever. It means a quiet place between the rapids or 
quite stretch of water. I'm putting forth the theory that it's not where or Orenbega doesn't mean where the Agencia lies, but it means how to get to it. So, right here in the city of St. John, in New Brunswick, we have some of the largest, some of the highest tides come through here. And we have this thing called the Reversing Falls. It's basically the river from the water pushes its way out through here and out into the ocean. But during high tide, the water pushes its way back up. It'll push the river all the way back up, up to here, I believe. And all in here is just crazy, crazy, crazy rapids. I'll, I got a little video that I'll put it on. I just don't want to make this video. It's already crazy long that I don't know, any longer that it has to be, right? So I'll make a video of that. But So I believe that Orenbega, or that term, Agancia or whatever, it means how you get there. They're referring to slack tide on the reversing falls. Slack tide provides an approximate 20 minute window for transversing the passage between the tide coming in and the tide coming out and when it's too rough to go through there. Like you only got really like 20 minutes every four hours or whatever it says. You only have a lot amount of, allotted amount of time. Other than that, other than that 20 minutes every four hours or whatever, it's impassable by boat. I think that when they re refer to that term, the quiet place between the rapids, I think that's how you get to it. Because you have to wait for the quiet time between the two rapids, or between the rapids. And so right here, one of the oldest spots in St. John is Indian Town. This is shows up on the oldest maps, is this spot here. So apparently the old story is that the uh, indigenous people would come up here and they would portage up into this spot where it's nice and still and then come up here and go and do their things and up river so i believe that there's a reason why this is shaped like an indigenous person's face <laughs> i believe that agencia is here i've mapped out some things here and like look at these places look at some of these spots here this some of this stuff just doesn't look right to me like, we have a waterway, and then you have, like, a you have like a burn or a wall going along, and on the other side of that, you have another river. And then you have all these mounds. There's these mounds in the river here, right? Right? There's all these mounds along. And then there's crazy things like this stuff, right? Like, what's happening here? What's going on? with these waterways, right? Is this all ancient waterworks, right? But you see, there's just these random lines every which way going all over the place. And they're, whoa, like they're just a river or a, a water, water path, a wall, and then on the other side, another river, river or whatever, waterway, right? So we're just gonna keep going up here and we're going to see what we find, because I mapped out a whole bunch of spots. I'll cruise out. But look at the stuff. Like, look at all of these. They just, some of the stuff just doesn't look right. Right? Like, look at this, look at this wall that they have here. Right? And some of them, you can follow these lines going off in the different directions. But... It's just these crazy, crazy stuff with the water. Like with these, with the, uh, like, I don't even know what these are. Waterways. Just crazy shapes. Like, is this just somebody having fun? Like, is this like a star fort? Like a piece of a star fort here? Like, what's going on with these shapes here, right? But they're all over this spot here. This is what you would call Gage Town. The name before that is apparently called Grim Ross. Uh, gems, lower gem sag here. There's a big, apparently there's a big um, fort that's around here somewhere. And it's talked about, but they don't give an exact location, of course, right? So I'm going to zoom in here. But like, look at some of these, look at how crazy this water shit, like this, these waterways are. And like, they got these round, right? Is that a mound? a tree on top right there's another one oops there's another one right there doesn't have a tree on top but and there's these like you know this one like what's going on with this 
right? Like, look at that. It's like a star fort, and there's like a mound in it. It looks like almost like a random, just kind of walled off area. Right? But like, look at all these swooshes and stuff. And then there's like, these half moon mounds, or say ancient mounds of Unogundi. Right? After you get past that, but like, look at the size of this river. It's nice and sailable. You can take a whole big ship up here. As long as you wait for slack tide, right? As long as you wait for Oron Bega, or whatever you want to call it. Quiet time between the rapids. So now we're here at New Brunswick Provincial Archives on the early history of New Brunswick by Moses H. Purley. So we're not going to read too much of this. It just tells you a little bit about kind of what happened here. This is just the introductory note. And we're going to get a good idea of how they're, how they're setting this whole thing up. The indifference of the majority of our race towards our local history will inevitably be replaced in time by the deep and widespread interest to which its rich and varied character entitles it. In the meantime, however, material of the highest historical value is being lost, and it it should be a pleasant duty for us to preserve such parts of it as may add to the glory of our people or the knowledge of our race. And obviously, they're going to leave out some stuff that leads their race in looking bad. There you go, boom, right off the hop, this is what you get. They're gonna tell you how, how this is. The manuscript which is to be printed in this and a few following numbers of the review is one most worthy of preservation. Its writer was one of the truest sons of New Brunswick has yet produced, and he lived with her interest always near his heart. Yeah, right. So that basically just tells you what the hell this is all about here. Mostly BS. We're going to get a little snippets of what actually happened. 
the manuscript includes two lectures. The first and about half of the second treat of the period from 1492 to 1758 and having necessarily been largely compiled of printed works contains little not to be found elsewhere. And to be honest with you, you can't even really find it in this. Uh, all the links at the bottom you don't go anywhere special. So now we're going to get a little bit um, a little bit of history of the gentleman who's writing this book. So this is him, Moses Henry Purley. He was born at Maugerville. He was, through his mother, a grandson of Israel Purley, the leader of Maugerville Colony as described below. So he's, this guy has a horse in this race, so he is obviously going to make his grandpappy look good, right? He's not going to talk smack about him. We're going to notice that later on. From a youth he was fond of the woods and spent all the time he could spare from his profession with his gun and rod and Indian friends. He was a true lover of the forest as the Indians knew when they made him their chief. What? <laughs> So, what happened? They just made him the chief? Like, alright, I guess that's one of the ways they got whiter, maybe. Maybe this is a good way when you become chief. Uh, maybe he, this guy started installing Prima Nocta. He held several most responsible offices under both imperial and local governments and performed all duties in a manner most acceptable to the authorities and to the great advantage of his native country. So they're saying that he, this guy is native but not indigenous. He's a native Indian but he's not an indigenous Indian. A five dollar Indian. You know what I mean? This guy just somehow worked his way into he held several most responsible offices in both local and imperial governments and he was a chief come on now this guy definitely imposed himself on them somebody forced their way into being the chief of everything here this moses henry pearly dude so before we get into the meat of this website here i need to tell you about the expulsion of the acadians just a quick little jaunt over here the expulsion of the Acadians, or known as the Great Upheaval, or the Great Expulsion, or the Deportation, or the Grand Derangement, was basically them kicking out the Acadians out of, out of the Canadian Maritimes, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and PEI. The Great Expulsion occurred from 1755 to 1764 during the French-Indian War. I'm pretty certain the French and Indians were on the same side, and it was the, the British that were attacking everybody. With that in mind, in 1758, at the same time of the last expedition proceeded against Louisville, a British force was sent to take possession of this harbor, St. John. The force, consisting of part of the regiment of provincial and a company of rangers, took possession of the ruins of a French fort at Carleton. So they already came there and it was already in ruins, right? So what happened? Why was it already in ruins? This would be Fort Frederick. But the place is already in ruins, so, like, they just basically, you know, secured themselves the best they could for the winter that it was coming. So, this, uh, Captain McCurdy, him and three of his boys went up the St. John River, and somewhere on Belle Island in Kingston, they were cutting down a tree on a steep hill, and the tree fell down and killed Captain McCurdy instantly. Yeah, right? <laughs> Good job, boys. <laughs> right off the hop, you killed the captain with a tree. The rest of the party ended up proceeding to go on to St. Anne's Point, which is now Fredericton, where they found a quiet little town. Oh, so what did they do in this quiet little town that they found? Oh, they set fire to the chapel. Nice. <laughs> what a bunch of assholes. But a number of French settlers gathered together, whereupon the rangers retreated, but being hotly pursued, they committed several atrocious acts upon people who fell in their way to prevent their giving information. But uh, by per reversing their snowshoes, they ended up getting away. Like, what a bunch of jackasses just coming in here, setting a fire, and then when people try to stop you, you commit atrocious acts. By the, on the 30th of November in 1759, Colonel Arbuthnot wrote a letter to the governor of Nova Scotia about 200 French inhabitants 
with two priests had presented themselves wishing permission to remain on their lands. Their request was not, however, allowed. These guys asked to stay peacefully, and it was not allowed. How do they get them out, right? How do you get out a bunch of people that don't want to leave? Do you call in Captain Rogers? <laughs> So in 1760, a party of rangers dispatched from Quebec under Captain Steve Rogers to drive the French settlers off the St. John, they performed their duty ferociously, ravaging the country and burning and destroying all before them. We hear about them setting fire at all these places and repopulating the cities and repopulating the towns. So what do they do? They just go in and just destroy everything they just set fire to everything and burn it all down they've been doing it for a long time so the french fled in all directions some of them making their way up the river towards i think that's canada where struck with the beauty and fertility of the country above the grand falls and conceiving that they were not likely to be disturbed formed the settlement of Madawashka. So Madawashka is up here on the St. You know, the St. John River comes up all the way up here and goes all the way up. So they settled up here above the Grand Falls. So it says here, from all that I have been able to learn, oh, sorry, of this foray of Captain Steve Rogers <laughs> and his rangers, I believe that the less that is said about it, the better. So these guys were very rude people and this guy just says you know what we better not even touch on their history and whatever you learn about them it's not good so you rather just not talk about it better than actually bringing light into the horribleness of history in 1761 fort frederick in the harbor of saint john was garrisoned by a highland regiment in this year, the harbor of St. John was first regularly surveyed by Captain Bruce of the Royal Engineers. If you click on this, look, see, yeah, there's nothing there, right? No map. At this time, the provincial government became anxious to secure the possession of the River St. John and prevent the French from resuming possession of its fertile banks. New England had also a particular interest in the matter as numerous attacks upon their borders by the Indians were generally planned and fitted out on this river. The government of Massachusetts in 1761 dis dispatched a exploring party for this per for this purpose sorry of asserting the position of affairs and the state of the country on the St. John right so they said you should go make a map of this place and once they made a map they were like this place looks ill yo we need to go up in there and rob the shit out of it and new england was like yo you're gonna go in there and mash up these rude boys we want a part of it because they've been doing attacks on us too so they teamed up and they came in and did the great expulsion and they just mashed up this place so when you get the book with the longest title ever the most accurate description of the new world or of america's those guys can't find it why because this place is already been mashed up it's already been gone they arrived on the 19th of may 1762 and landed at portland point which is on the other side from carlton on the st john harbor where there was a small clearing and trace of an old french fort so how many french forts are there around here and what keeps happening how come they didn't discover that the first time around and what did the french come down build another fort and then burn it all out and then these guys rediscovering it again after they rediscovered the one on at carlton it's kind of odd right and then they say here mention of the skeletons at portland point right i think this is where fort latour sits now but this would be the fort before fort latour that they had they, they mentioned skeletons but when you click on the, the reference to it it just says here and there through the ms are references like this evident subject of side remarks about the lecture so something was interesting enough about these skeletons that they had a whole side part to 
of this lecture, but they're leaving out of this part reposting of it. So I often wonder, maybe there was giants, maybe there was in just indigenous historical articles, and maybe not just French. The only cleared spot about the harbor at that time were at and near Fort Frederick. As you perceive by the map and the ruins of the French fort at Portland Point, all the rest of the harbor, and particularly where the city now stands, wore a great dreary and forbidding aspect. The party found great difficulty in penetrating into the forest in this vicinity. All of the trees had been blown down. Right? What does that? How, how does that happen? You know, that's pretty crazy. By a tremendous hurricane which swept over the country west of St. John in 1758. So does that sound like a natural disaster or does that sound like something more? I'll let you salivate on that a little. The general opinion of the party was against taking lands bordering on or near this harbor. But in this opinion, Mr. Simmons and Mr. White did not concur. The party next proceeded up the river St. John, noticing as they passed the devastated settlements of the French and the blackened fragments of their buildings, which which had been mercilessly burnt. They particularly examined the remains of the celebrated old fort of Gemizic or Gemizic which I have so often had occasion to mention, right? So this guy talks to this Fort Gizemic a lot, and it's a celebrated fort, so this must have been a nice big, huge fort, or, you know, nice, good-sized fort that was celebrated, it was talked about, you know, it was, it was well-known, kind of, right? So he went there f to look at this fort. I am enabled to state on good authority that this famous fort, where so much fighting was done and bravery displayed, stood at the lower entrance of the Gemseg near the residence of Charles Harrison Esquire and on property now owned by him. Old swords, copper kettles, hatchets, and a variety of ancient articles have been frequently plothed up and relics and relics are found there to the present day. So I'm not quite certain when this article was, but they're still finding stuff there. I'm feeling I'm going to get myself a metal detector, ground penetrating radar, and make my way up to the lower gem seg. You know what I'm saying? See if we can actually dig up some real history here. At the close of the last lecture, Honorable Hugh Johnson, <laughs> yeah, that's right, Hugh Johnson, whose property is immediately opposite the site of the old fort, stated to me that his men ploughed up a cannonball of considerable size in his meadow last summer. What's considerable size? Is, is it really a cannonball or is it something else? The party pursued their course up the river Gemseg and on the hill where Burton Courthouse now stands, they found a French settler, the last and only one who remained. On reaching St. Anne's Point, where Fredericton now stands, they found the margin of the river along the whole of what is now the town plot of Fredericton, cleared for about 10 rods back from the bank. And they saw the ruins of a considerable settlement. The houses had been burnt and the cultivated land has fast re lapsed into the wilderness estate. At the mouth of the river Nashwaak, the remains of a fortress were visible. The solitary Frenchman whom they met told them that this fortress was reported to have been built by a party of settlers from Scotland long prior to the settlement of the French at St. Anne's. This statement is very likely correct, as the Earl of Stirling sent settlers to this country from Scotland under Claude de la Tour. 
The Earl of Stirling sent settlers from Scotland under the guise of Claude de la Tour. Doesn't sound Scottish to me. Who probably built this fort at Meshwaak. And now let's see if this shows anything. It is now known that the fort was built by the French in 1692. It was called by them Fort St. Joseph. All right. Um, at the time, he built the noted Fort Gemseg, which is fully and clearly established he did under the authority of Earl Sterling. Obviously, they don't know who built these two forts. The French are saying it was the Scots. The Scots are proven not to be the people. And they say it's the French, but the French are saying it's not them. It's kind of like the native people now saying they don't know who built the mounds when the indigenous people are actually saying that they built the mounds. <laughs> Maybe that's why you don't know is because you're not the people that were here. <laughs> the map of the Great River St. John and Waters. The first ever published. This is the from the Bay of Fundy up to St. Anne's or Frederick's Town. Being little known by white people until 1783. So who did all this, you say? Settled by the American loyalists, then a part of Nova Scotia, now called New Brunswick. From the actual survey made in the years 1784, 85, 86, and 87 by Robert Campbell, surveyor, captain of the 40th Company of the St. John Loyalists, right? So we jump over here to a CBC News which are Canadian Broadcasting some BS. They talk about New Brunswick's surprising black history, right? They kind of put this under the Willie O'Ree thing with, yeah, he's a really good melanated hockey player, and uh, he was the first one in the NHL, and the Jackie Robinson of NHL, you could call him. They put this under the the this website, right? Loyalists, right? Who are the loyalists that came here that settled New Brunswick? About 3,300 black loyalists arrived in St. John in the mid-1780s after the American Revolutionary War. So these, it was settled by the American, sorry, settled by 3,300. It's a nice uh, fuck mason number if you know your shit. But it was settled by black loyalists. They had been promised land grants in exchange for their service to the British Army, right? Then that land did not materialize. Many left. We jump back over to the map here. You will see all over here, Negro settlements. Negro settlement. Negro settlement, right? They are all over this place, right? All up the river. They're all in, funny enough, they're all in Kings County. You can get into my Acadian video, Breaking Down Steely Dan's The Royal Scam, about all this. But look at this, this is in 1700s, this was right, they got block houses up here. More loyalist settlements, right, there's loyalist settlements all over this place. Also, if you look at it here too, loyalists, loyalists, all this land set out for loyalists. Lots for loyalists, lots for loyalists, all on the Oromacto, right, all on the Oromacto River. And all in here, in Gage Town. Gage Town and Gemseg, that's going to come up later on. We just wonder if, if it's all the way up here that these melanated people were settled, where are they? Where did they go? The leader among the black loyalists, Thomas Peters, petitioned colonial officials for several years on behalf of his people before joining forces with a British company to establish a colony of free blacks in Africa. Peters helped recruit 17 boatloads of people that migrated from the Maritimes to Africa. He is considered one of the founder founders of the nation of Sierra Leone. His son, Jason Peters, renamed, sorry, remained in the Maritimes where his descendants mingled with Acadians and indigenous people, dodged the hijack because they were probably one of the two here. They're probably the indigenous people already. And he stayed here and mixed with them. So what do you think that his son looks like now that he's mixed with what we now call Acadians and not what they what were Acadians? That's him. That's his son. Does he look pretty, uh, does he look like a black loyalist? There's his uh, great, 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 great grandpappy. And now he's a descendant, right? David Peters holds up a picture, bronze statue of his descendants erected in Sierra Leone. So this whole movement that just happened right here that we were, that we just read, this whole movement, this is why your DNA, when you do DNA testing and they're like, oh, you're from Sierra Leone. 
it's because they left here and went to Sierra Leone, right? They're not from there. They came, they left here and went there. And that's why your your DNA footprints are over there is because they their footprints left your land. And now we're over there and they're in, their, in Sierra Leone doing their own thing. A lot of the so-called Negroes were from here, were indigenous to here and set up free black colonies there just to run away from the British and people who were messing with them here. You feel me? This, I think, Gage Town is against you on the Unogundi River. Yeah. Pretty crazy stuff, man. So you tell me what you think if my idea is too far out there, man. I don't know. Just tell me what you think in the comments. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Believe I, uh, I basically, you can watch all my other videos if you want to see the old buildings in the actual city of St. John, which could possibly be uh, another location of the Agencia, because they did say that they thought it was near the mouth of the river, but I think Agencia could be Gage Town or the Unogundi River, which would be in David Ingram's travels. He heard it as Gunda. So there's Gunda, there's Uno Gundy, the Bay of Gundy, Agunsia. See where it's all fitting in? It doesn't really necessarily fit with the Penescob River, how they would just change the name so far and do all that. But it makes me think that it would be this the St. John River. But who am I? I'm just a guy in a basement making videos. So tell me what you think. I love you guys. Y'all be safe. Thanks for all the good vibes and I'm, I'm hopefully I'm gonna get some good vibes out there for you guys in return. Thank you. I appreciate you. Bye.